morning, everyone. This is Sanjeev uh, from Arafadi for You, and on behalf of uh, Arafadi for You team, I welcome again everyone to webinar number three. Today we are going to be discussing standards, protocols, and regulation, which, uh, from our experience, time and again, uh, is one of the hard topics because it requires all the cramming and the numbers and you know remembrance on okay uh, these are the standards which are going to be used in hf and lf and uhf and what kind of protocols and what kind of regulations are available so we thought it's very important for us to give a brief snapshot on what it's going to do and what's going to uh, you know be asked on and again, my request will be to again go over these uh, standards, protocols, and regulation again and again because this is like an exam cramming. You know, you need to remember those numbers, and those numbers are going to get asked some of those. Once again, for the people who just joined, uh, fast track RFID certification training will be held on April 10th in room S320 FNG. Room typically get open by around 6.37. Our team will be there. Uh, the breakfast is served over there. Lunch is also served over there along with all the refreshments. Um, the class starts at eight o'clock and it will continue till five o'clock in the evening when the keynote session starts. Exam starts are next day, April 11th and 12th. Exam starts at 12 o'clock. It's 90 minutes exam. Before the start, they will, they are going to register and do all the paperwork and then start the exam. Our next review webinar, number four, is going to be on April 4th at 10 a.m. EST. And for those people who have taken online quizzes, it's very important. Those are multiple choice questions. It's going to be the same way as you are going to be seeing in the exam. Uh, very, very similar format. But the answers can be located in a link which is embedded in the webinar email so if you can go it's a google drive answers you can see all the answers to the quizzes please review those we will be adding more quizzes in next week so it's very very important as much practice you can do that will help you in the exam any questions before we start all right We'll mute everyone and give the presenter to Jean, who is going to take today's uh, uh, webinar. Just a minute, Jean. The presenter is coming to you. Thank you. And you should have it. Yes. Muted. It okay, let me uh... so can everyone see my screen? Yeah, everyone is on a mute, so probably I can see okay. so everything is okay. Okay. So as as Sanjay mentioned, two very important parts of RFID, <clears throat> both from just the, the application point of view and what it, what you do and how it works, uh, as well as uh, a number of questions that are going to be on the test uh, are relate to regulations and standards, which is the first portion of today's presentation uh, discussion. And the second portion deals with protocols uh, for RFID. Uh, and these are values and numbers as Sanjeev mentioned that you need to know you need to uh, understand them uh, but you certainly need to know the numbers the uh, values you know, for example the regulations the numbers uh, as well as the protocols so uh, so anyway so we'll get going and um, a, a suggestion on questions if you have questions as we go through here um, you can certainly unmute yourself, uh, ask a question, and then uh, after we're done, you know, we can mute yourself again. Uh, or the other alternative, which is the preferred way, I prefer you do it that way. But a second way, if you had any questions, is you can go ahead and write them down. And then at the end of the session, we will uh, go back and uh, have, 
give you the opportunity to ask any questions. So either way is, is fine uh, as we go through these. So first thing is we're going to talk about is regulations uh, and standards uh, and the and the impact that they have because the, these are the, those features that are created by organizations and or governments uh, rules for use of the technology. So it's important that we understand them. Uh, they're all based upon the differences between the air interface protocol. Now, when we talk about a protocol, air interface protocol, we're talking about how the readers interface with the tags. In other words, the reader, as you learned earlier, sends out a signal to the tag. The tag uh, responds to that signal uh, and sends data back and forth. And so that interface between the two of those is what's called a protocol. And that protocol is what controls and manages uh, everything about that interface. Uh, and, and there are many standards and regulations by individual country as to the different characteristics of those protocols that you can have, the power, the, the uh, frequency ranges, all those things are part of the regulations and the standards. So, so that's why it's important that we understand these. The regulatory requirements globally and by region, we're going to talk about this and understand that uh, the regulations for use of RFID in the United States is different than regulations in Europe or in many other countries within uh, the world. So we need to understand that. Uh, we need to understand that in all cases, the, the most important thing with any regulation is to maintain safety uh, for both humans and animals. Uh, so a clue for you, if you see a question on the test that says which of the following is most important, or if it says humans and animals, that will always be the right answer. It is always the most important thing uh, that we have safety uh, relative to the uh, use of RFID. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about mandates. Uh, the, these are, uh, mandates are uh, structures or uh, directions put out by different organizations to or using RFID within their environment. The most famous one in the past has been the, the Walmart mandates earlier on in RFID history. Uh, but sir, the most important, at least in the United States right now, is the Department of Defense mandates. If you want to use RFID, you have to follow their specific requirements. And so we're going to talk about those. So standards are created by standard creating organizations. They may or may not be government. However, the non-compliance may affect the ability to use the products or do work with that particular company or organization, but there are no legal consequences. Uh, so in standards, probably the most famous one that all of you are uh, familiar with is the ASCII standard, which is how we encode the bit structure for data uh, as it's stored on a, uh, you know, within the computers and, and transmitted through through the air. So standards, uh, so ASCII is a standard that's probably one of the most common ones, most understood ones, that's requirements. We'll talk more about those in a minute. Regulations are created by governments and may vary between different governing authorities. In other words, cities, states, counties, districts, uh, parishes, whatever, organizational structures you have within your, your business, uh, within your uh, countries. Um, and it applies within the physical boundaries of the regulating authority. In other words, in the, in the United States, it's the, uh, uh, has its authority as well as the various different countries have their own authorities that establish what the regulations are going to be. And then mandates, as I mentioned, are created by organizations to achieve some goal uh, increase efficiency, reduce costs. Uh, Non-compliance just means that you aren't going to be able to do business with them, but there's no legal requirements. Whereas with regulations, regulations are legally binding and carry criminal penalties and or civil penalties for uh, non following the regulations. Okay, so standards. Standards 
there's once again, our, <clears throat> any number of organizations, including governments, can set standards. ISO, International Organization for Standardization, uh, uh, IEC, IEEE, all of those are ones that most of you are familiar with. Um, and those are all private organizations, government, ind industry specific. Uh, the, the, these are various different uh, government uh, standard setting organizations. Once again, standards are required if you want to do business with uh, with these organizations and structures, you have to follow these standards. However, they're not legally binding. Uh, there's no criminal penalty if you choose not to uh, not to work with any of these. So government and the uh, region country specific, the FCC, which is the Federal Communication Commission for the United States, uh, ETSI, which handles the European Telecommunications Standard, uh, the European Council of Postal Telecommunications, I see these are examples of some of them. There are many, many more. So, uh, and then we have the environmental regulations, uh, which are, let's try that again, which are important hero, which is your health and environmental research, which are basically determined, uh, once again, health, health and environmental. You have the intrinsically safe, you have the ATEX, um, you have non-incendiary. There are many more. We're going to talk about, uh, point out the ones that uh, are significant as, as it relates to uh, RFID journal and the RFID journal exams. So these are all examples of different standard settings organizations. Uh, the types of standards that you can talk about are air interface, uh, which once called is the protocol. And we're going to talk a lot more about that coming up here at the second part of the session, uh, but you also have host interface, hardware requirements, uh, data syntax, structures, contents. Uh, the data contents, if any of you are particularly familiar with barcodes and barcode structures, uh, those same barcode structures are in, uh, as set as standards and they're enforced within the uh, RFID. So if you're looking at uh, data identifiers, application identifiers, the syntax, all of those are uh, all critical uh, for how you format and structure the data. You have conformance. If you're dealing with printers, there are very specific print uh, quality standards, test procedures, compliance specifications, uh, application standards, uh, labeling, product packaging, numbering schemes. For example, if you're going to work with the automotive industry, then you must follow the auto industry's uh, standards for labeling and how you label product, if you're going to deal with the DOD in the United States, Department of Defense in the United States, then what you label those set a whole variety of standards. Um, on the other side of things, standards, since they're set by non, uh, they're non-binding, any of us, you or I or anybody else can come up and develop a standard. And we could come up with and you will see this on many of the advertisings, particularly for drugs and supplements and things like that, that will come up and I could write a standard that says Donlin standard for how to bake a cake. And I could create that standard. I could give it a number. I could do all the rest of it and I could publish it. And now I have a standard. However, if nobody certifies that standard or uses that standard, then it becomes irrelevant. But as the popular saying goes, the great thing about standards is there's so many of them to choose from. So on virtually every product that goes out there is going to meet some standard. Uh, and what's important in this portion of it is to look at that standard and who creates that standard and the significance of that standard. So when you're looking at medical things and it says we meet these standards, and everybody says, oh, that's important, that's good. Well, take a look at the standard and who created it, and whether it's a widely accepted standard or, or whether it's just something that uh, the individual organization created for itself. So it could say that it meets that standard. So once again, standards are created by organizations or by people. Um, and uh, have no significance unless you are working with somebody else who acknowledges that standard and works with that standard. Now, the pr primary standard organiza setting organization of the world is ISO, uh, which is comprised of 146 countries. Uh, the countries select, they do, of that, 85 
of those 146 are actually voting members. And when you create a standard, <clears throat> you have to have, uh, to get ISO support and agreement, you have to have 100% compliance with all 85 countries. So you have to, you have, to have a unanimous vote uh, by each of the countries to be able to get a the standard approved by ISO. Uh, so you can imagine that when you set a standard, the standard may not be the best technologically for the world, but it is the one that can get passed and agreed to by all the different 85 voting members of the, of the country, of the different countries. So, and countries select a domestic organization to represent the ISO, for example, and the American National Standards Institute, SEC Canada, AF France, et cetera. Those are all the <clears throat> ISO organizations within each of the countries. And each of those countries put together what they think are the correct standards. They go to ISO, then, then everything is negotiated through those uh, different countries. And then each country gets one vote. And you must have unanimous vote to get a standard approved. Now, to give you an idea of how complicated this becomes, <clears throat> this is just AIDC, and you learned in earlier session that automatic information data collection or, or data capture. So, within the AIDC focus of just of the ISO committees, if you look at this structure, you see all these different organizations, and down at the bottom, at the left, for example on product marketing, you go down to the bottom and you'll see your database, your EDI issues, applications and RFID supply chain. So RFID comes in down here. If you come over to the ISO JTC1, once again, if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, real-time location systems, which 433, which includes RFID. You'll see the W working group three. You'll see that you have performance and conformance, which is part of RFID. And then each of these working groups, working group one, two, three, four, and five, you have committees. And then under the committees, you have subcommittees. And under the subcommittees, you have consultants. Or uh, So it's a very complicated structure. And trying to get something all the way through and approved by everybody uh, can be very difficult, very time consuming, which is why it takes so long to get a standard uh, approved, at least within the ISO community. So in ISO RFID standards, <clears throat> the technology standards that we're going to talk about in particular are all in the ISO 18,000 series. <clears throat> so we'll have 18,001, 18,000, and then 18,001 through 18,007. All of those cover all the different frequency ranges uh, within RFID, and, and so there's a different ISO number, and you will need to know these numbers, and we're going to go through them here shortly. So your technology standards, ISO 18,000, 18,000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and in the case of 6, it'll be 6 A, B, or C. <clears throat> and then we have data content. <clears throat> Obviously, if we're going to have standards, we don't talk about and try to standardize the data itself, but we do standardize the data content and, and the structure of the data. Where, what data is required? Where is it located? How is it, how is it written into, uh, into the uh, uh, records or in, into the different fields? So all these are all data content standards that, that are important. Uh, probably the most important of these is 15961, which is what we're going to talk about here shortly. Then you have conformance and performance, which is 46 and 47. And we, we, you learned a little bit about active and passive technologies, I believe. So uh, we'll talk about that. And then we have application standards, uh, which is standards for if you're going to do container tracking, if you're going to do automotive tracking, if you're going to do there's application standards. So we have different versions of uh, different varieties of ISO standards. <clears throat> so within the ISO 18,000 18, frequency, uh, if it's less than 135, now if looking at your frequency earlier, this is your low frequency. So we'll, we have an ISO standard for low frequency. 1356 is high frequency. 2.45 is uh, um, yeah, microwave, and uh, there's 
1860 to 960 is is uh, UHF, and 433 are active tags. Why do we have so many different uh, frequencies that we use? As you learned earlier, that uh, based upon read range, based upon material, based upon tagging, based upon government regulation, based upon a whole variety of things, uh, we have to use or choose to use different frequencies. Frequencies, not one frequency. Frequency doesn't cover all things, so therefore we have different frequencies, and for each frequency we have to have standards as to what to use and how to use them. <clears throat> so this slide you need to know. There's no way around it. You need to understand this numbers. Now this all works. So if we look at 18001, it's generic standard for the air interface. Remember. All of our standards that we're talking about in the 18,000 series are the protocols, which is the air interface for globally accepted frequencies. In other words, this is also global. So no matter what country you go to in the world, these frequencies apply as far as the standards. And since it's the ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, these are worldwide, global. 18,000-2 is for low frequency. 18,000-3 is for high frequency. 18,000-4 is for microwave. And 18,000-5 uh, should have had some discussion previously that microwave is, even though it was set up initially as a standard uh, frequency to be used, is rarely used at any level because there are so many other devices out there that are, uh, it's an unregulated frequency, and there are so many other devices that can use it. There's so much interference that use of microwave, the 18,004, uh, is virtually non-existent in the world, certainly in the RFID world. But when they set up the standard structure, they set it up, and they also said, well, microwave, we can also go to 5.8 gigahertz on the microwave. And because nobody ever took off and used 18,004, as we discussed, uh, they have withdrawn 18,005, which is the higher speed, the 5.8 gigahertz for microwave. So there's a number allocated for it, but it is not ever used uh, because it was withdrawn. We have 18,004, which is microwave, which is also uh, lower, uh, 2.45 gigahertz, which is also uh, rarely used. And then we have 18,006, which is the key primary one that you really need to make sure you understand, because this is for UHF, ultra high frequency. And then uh, you have 18,007, which is for your active tags. And this is the frequency at which the active tags transmit, which is 433 megahertz. Okay, know these numbers, know these slides. No way to get around it. Uh, you may see one or more of these on, on the test, so make sure you understand this slide. All right, I'm going to go through each of them in some detail, uh, and I will point out specifically what you need to make sure that you know. Uh, on low frequency, uh, it's 18,002, which is below 135 uh, kilohertz. Now, you notice we're dealing in kilohertz down here, which is low frequency. Uh, and this is for, uh, primarily for use uh, related to animals and humans. Uh, it has very, very slow transmit speed. It has very uh, uh, limited amount of data. You're looking at 16 bits of data that can be transmitted with this. Uh, and so <clears throat> there are two different types of transmission, not important to understand uh, because they, they are interchangeable and synonymous. <clears throat> so, but in, important to know this is low frequency. It's in the kilohertz range. It's used primarily with animals and humans. Uh, and if, uh, if you got into the RF portion of this, you'll find out that this uh, uses inductive coupling for communications. Uh, if we haven't covered that in the previous sessions, we will uh, be part of the part of the course. Okay, so that's 8,002 low frequency animals, people. Uh, 18,003, which is high frequency. Uh, it's very important uh, frequency. The two primary frequencies that are used in the world 
today are HF and UHF. Uh, so high frequency, uh, once again, is based upon uh, the uh, inductive coupling, which means that it's good for transmitting through and around water. Um, and you'll notice in here, it talks about specific layer, anti-collision communications protocols, et cetera. We're going to talk about those protocols because each of these frequencies have unique protocols and that's why it's under, which is how the interface air interface works and that's what we're going to talk about the, that in the protocol session um, operating modes there are many different modes for this uh, if you've heard of my fair that's an hf frequency if you've heard of uh, 15693 that's an hf frequency so this is an important one to understand it's high frequency 13.56 megahertz so we've gone from low frequency which is kilohertz which is a thousand cycles per second versus megahertz which is a million cycles per second so uh, and widely used uh, throughout the world uh, and so it's an important frequency to remember 18,003 so <clears throat> within 18,003 there are two general uh, generic uh, categories of high frequency. One is the one that you use on all your credit cards, where you're using RFID for credit cards, RFID for bank cards, um, all of that. And they're called proximity systems, and that's 18,014,443 A and B. You should know this number. Uh, it's, it's a subset under HF. Uh, so it's 14. 443 AMB, these are all your credit cards. Proximity cards, meaning you have, you have a read range of up to a millimeter or two. So you have to, proximity, uh, you have to be very, very close. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the difference between A and B is not significant in terms of uh, what we're doing here, uh, but uh, understand that there is an A and B uh, portion of it. The second uh, use of HF, uh, which is uh, ISO 18,003, uh, is what are called vicinity cards, which is ISO 15693. This is an important number for you to understand, an important uh, standard for you to understand, because this is for what are called uh, vicinity cards. So these are the frequencies that are used for access, uh, building access, where you have read ranges up to a maximum of about re reliably up to about a foot you can get up to two feet in some instances but basically you're going to be in the proximity of the reader uh, as opposed to uh or excuse me you're going to be in the vicinity of the reader which means uh so once again access cards are the most common thing that that you'll see uh, but and uh Okay, so the two pieces you want to remember for you have ISO HF, which is ISO 18003, that has 14443A and B, which are your credit cards, and they're called proximity cards. You have ISO 15693, which are vicinity cards. They're primarily uh, best known for, for your uh, access cards when you go to access a building or a door. Okay, and so it took, all three numbers are important to remember. Now, the next most and probably more important than HF is the UHF uh, standards. So 18,006C, the letter C is in Charlie, uh, 18,006C is the standard for uh, all of your UHF ultra high frequency and, and it's a frequency range of 860 to 960 megahertz. And there are different versions of this. The key version here, there's been an A, a B, obviously, and a C, and we're on version C. And version C, aside from other modifications, the key things there, we're talk, we'll talk about Q factor for anti-collision, which we'll talk about when we talk about protocols, and also the, the class one Gen 2 standard, which we'll also talk about when we talk about protocols. Uh, so version C is the standard that requires Q factor for protocol as well as the uh, class one gen two protocols. All right. Now, the other thing 
that's important is you notice up here on all the frequencies we've talked about thus far, there's been a frequency. So HF was less than 135, uh, excuse me, LF, HF was 1356. Uh, here we have a range of frequencies from 860 to 960. And the reason for this is that when HF came along, when UHF came along, excuse me, it went into the world and the United States says, well, we're going to use 915 as the base, 902 to 928 as the range for UHF. And all the rest of the world, you should use the same. Well, when they went to all the different countries of the world, uh, they said, we can't because that, those frequencies or that range has already been allocated to something else. So in Europe, for example, and in Japan, 915 is has been allocated to cell phone usage. So we couldn't use 915, which is what the United States uses. So we then we went back to each country and said, okay, tell us what frequency range you can give us or frequencies. And so based upon on that, everybody came back and we came up with a frequency that's somewhere between 860 megahertz to 960 megahertz worldwide. So that's why we have a range here. Each country has come up with what works within its own structure, within its own organization. What this means to us from a functional point of view is that if we build something that works with UHF, it has to work at anywhere any of the, in any of the countries and anywhere in the frequency range from 860 to 960 megahertz. Okay, that's why we have a range here. Okay. Then we have what's called, for whatever reason, uh, we have what's called NFC, near field communication, uh, which is, uh, this was slide the previous slide is in order sorry about that but so we're going to going to go back uh, uh, a bit uh, to 1356 and if you remember 1356 we had 14 443 a and b and we had 15 693 uh, and then we have near field communication near field communication is when you hold the two phones together and they transmit the data back and forth uh, and you have very short read, uh, read ranges. NFC, near field communication, uses ISO 14443 standard, which is an HF standard, for doing this communication. Very short read ranges. Um, and so that's what NFC is, uh, near field communication. All right. And it says here you have a read range of up to four centimeters. Uh, and that's an absolute maximum. Uh, more likely you're going to be down to a couple of centimeters. Uh, but anyway, so that's uh, near field communication uses HF uh, 13.56 uh, and ISO 14443. Uh, read range based on 13.56 megahertz. It's compatible with all the technology. Use the 14443 A and B standard. You have very slow data exchange rates. You know, your modes of communication, once again, it's it's passive if you haven't talked about uh, active and passive communications. Initiator uh, provides the carrier field. The active communication mode, uh, the target devices communicate by altern alternately generating the flow. In other words, if you're reading a, an NFC tag, then you're following the passive communication mode. Uh, if you have two the devices that are talking to each other and exchanging data back and forth, then that's called the active communication mode for NFC. Okay. Uh, and then you have the <clears throat> NFC operation modes. Once again, you have a card emulation where a device, one device is emulating a car, a tag or a card. Uh, you have a reader writer mode where you're reading and or writing data to the tag and then you have the peer-to-peer -peer mode where you're sending communications uh, back and forth between the two uh, devices they're actively interacting with each other and this is what's on your smartphones um, and uh, particularly with your android devices uh, and when your apple devices when you're doing apple pay uh, that's nfc okay now for whatever reason, also, there was one slide that is not in this deck for whatever reason, uh, and that is ISO 
18,000-7, and ISO 18,000-7 is for active communication. It's, so if we go back to this here, ISO 18,007 is your air interface, 443 megahertz, in which the, you have the uh, tag actively transmitting, and all the other in ISO 18,002 through 6, the you have what's called interrogator talks first. The interrogator has to start the communication, hits the tag, energizes the tag, uh, and then allows the tag to reflect the wave back or communicate back with the reader. All those are what are called passive communications. 18,007 has to where the tag itself has a transmitter built onto it. it has a battery it has a transmitter and it's transmitting and then so you have the protocol for 18007 have active tags that are in effect actually transmitting so once again this slide that's in front of you make sure you understand all these numbers all the frequencies that, and also do a translation to understand that 135 kilohertz is low frequency, 1356 megahertz is high frequency, 245 gigahertz uh, is microwave, 58 is microwave, been withdrawn, 860 to 960 is UHF, 433 is active. Okay, make sure you understand all of those. Okay. Down to this one, regulations. Regulations are created by governments, vary between the governing authorities, uh, federal, national, consortium of nations, for example, EC, um, or the EU, excuse me. They apply within the physical boundaries of the regulating authority, and they're legally binding. If you don't comply with these, you can go to jail. So they're legally binding. Uh, okay. The RFID readers transmit and receive RF energy. This transmission is controlled by various regulations to avoid injury to humans and animals. Once again, if you see, why do we have regulations? What's the most, if you see injury to human and animal, that is the most important piece of any regulation is to make sure that we ensure safety to humans and animals, okay? Interference to and from local radio broadcast mobile systems and other radio waves. In other words, we, we don't want to uh, be, trying to use the cell phone at the same time we're transmitting with RFID on the same frequency ranges. So we have each country sets its regulations as to what the frequency ranges are going to be for each of those technologies, okay? And this way the need for regulation by government or agencies arise, all right? Now within the world, there are three ITU regions, um, not very well understood or used much anymore, but you have IT region one is Europe and Asia. You have region two, which is the Americas. And then you have region three, which is uh, Southeast Asia and uh, including Australia. Here are the names of the, some of the main regulating bodies within the countries. So the key ones we're going to talk about are the FCC, Federal Communication Commission, Mission and in Europe, Etsy. But if you look at the, whatever country you have, this is the organization that sets the, creates the regulations uh, for uh, for those particular countries or regions. And as we talked earlier, here's a worldwide map of RFID UHF frequencies, and you'll see that each country or group of countries has a uh, frequency range that's established for them. Uh, and these are obviously just the primary ones. So any country in which you plan to operate or want to work with RFID, you need to go to their regulating authority and identify what frequency ranges are required for those particular or for that particular country or group of countries. So the key things to remember here is that the United States is 902 to 928. Uh, optimum at 915, but 9, 928, and that Europe is 865, 6 to 865, 867, 868, 6. Okay, now there's some other, okay. Anyway, so those are the key ones to remember. Regulatory parameters, the power radiated, uh, and brief review, we have two ways that we measure the, the power that's radiated from the antenna. 
in the United States, we use what's called EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power. And that is the power that is created from a, an isotropic antenna, which is the theoretical antenna. Europe uses what's called ERP, effective radiated power, which is used with a dipole antenna uh, as the base for the, for the measurement. So you'll have the each uh, regulation will establish how much power you can uh, emit from the antenna, and it'll either be specified in EIRP if it's the United States, or it'll be specified in ERP, effective radiated power, for other countries, including Europe. Bandwidth usage, in other words, how much, uh, how, how big a bandwidth, uh, how, how big is your frequency range in the United, United States, it's 902 to 928. Uh, the channel and channel spacing. Channels, each of the, the bandwidths is broken down. Uh, for example, the United States is 902 to 928. Uh, obviously, any given uh, device doesn't need that much bandwidth uh, to do a transmission. So in the United States, they've broken that bandwidth down into 500 kilohertz channels. And so we have effectively 50 channels. Uh, so the channel and channel spacing and the usage, that also is specified uh, within your uh, regulations and a duty cycle and a duty cycle is just how long is a uh, device on or off if any, if you have a microwave for example and you put it at 50 percent power it doesn't reduce the total power by 50 percent it just is on for half the time so it's on for a second it's off for a second it's on for a second it's off for a second i mean that's a duty cycle and we can uh, the duty cycles are established part of the regulation uh, within uh, each of the different countries as to a device can transmit for a specific amount of time that it has to be off for a specific amount of time. So that's a duty cycle, uh, if you had not discussed that before. So all these are created, established, and managed within the regulations within the countries. Once again, ERP versus EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power, is just a unit of measure, and that's used uh, by... So some countries, many countries, and the U.S. is the primary one. Uh, in Europe, on the other hand, they use what's called effective radiated power, in which case you see the picture to the right. You see the, the round circle there. It's an isotropic antenna. The uh, other uh, diagram there where you see it identifies the dipole antenna. So this is just the antenna that was used to establish the power. Uh, and so in the United States, we use effective isotropic radiated power. Uh, Europe uses ERP effective radiated power and uh, as a unit of measure. And at the step down the bottom, if you want to convert EIRP to ERP, you multiply it by 1.64. And therefore, two watts of EIRP, which is the European uh, regulation, is equivalent to 3.2 watts of EIRP in the US. Okay. So just when you see EIRP and ERP, those are the units of measure that are used by the regulatory authority to establish the amount of power. FCC, everything in the, in the United States, if you're going to deal with, want to know anything about the regulations, it'll be section 15.247. So if you have any questions about what are the regulations within the U.S., go to 15.2.7, 247.247, and that will give you all of the regulations relating to RFID within the United States. All right. And the regulations they have are A through I. And obviously, there's a lot more detail when you look up the, re the uh, specific regulations. But anyway, you see the different uh, regulations for frequency hopping, maximum peak conduct output power operations, direction of antenna gain limits of power emitted, et cetera. So anytime you want to work with the United States, you're going to go to FCC section 15.247, and it will show you all of the different uh, seven, oh, excuse me, different, uh, nine different uh, regulations. Okay. And frequency hopping, uh, this gets very technical, uh, but this just within A, within section A, it talks about frequency hopping. Um, it deals the maximum peak output, B, uh, 
Um, those are the two key ones. Uh, European, you have the European Radio Communications Office, which uh, establishes uh, recommendations for all of the countries. Uh, and that, uh, but since the European Radio Communication Office, and we're going to talk about the uh, ETSI here in a minute, but also for EU's, since EU has to be established by a government, it's a regulation, ERO and ETSI are not government or are standard setting organizations, not government organizations, but they do set the standards for the countries within those organizations within the EU, and, but it's still up to each country within the EU to take that standard and make it a regulation. So, uh, which they all do, but uh, so it, it's one anomaly in terms of ETSI and FC and uh, ERO are standard setting organizations, but by European contracts, uh, each of the country has to then take that standard and and implement it as a regulation. Only countries can, or governing authorities can implement regulation. So yeah, SC is the Telecommunication Standards Institute. Once again, sets up the, uh, the standards for what can be used within uh, Europe and in the countries, and it, but it's up to each country then take that standard and make it into a regulation for that country. So important uh, acronyms to understand is ETSI, which is the Euro European Telecommunication Standards Institute. And back in European, uh, originally established, uh, if you recall, they had to determine for UHF what their particular frequency range was going to be. And so they've come up with what is now, if you see, 865 to 868 uh, megahertz. Uh, so they have 15 channels, as you can see the chart below. But effectively within Europe, you only have 10 channels. As you can see, you have the three at the low end are only 0.1 watt versus the two on the right are, are 0 0.1. Yeah, the two on the on the right are, 0, are 0.5 watts. Uh, as you find out, uh, it's very, very low, low power and not particularly usable. Once again, this is for UHF, ultra high frequency. So and this was set by ETSI, which was then put into uh, regulations within each of the countries, okay? So when you look at what's available in Europe today, you're effectively looking at the most 865 to 868, okay? And if you look at the effectively, it'll be 865.6 to 867.6 are the effective uses uh, at, you know, for uh, anything dealing with the EU, okay? Here is a summary chart on all your regulations. Um, channel spacing, you, you notice power on the right, some are EIRP, some are ERP. Uh, once again, those are just units of measure for the power, the regulatory environments. Um, so it's a reference chart, gives you a summary of what's available. Safety regulations within FCC, Remember FCC, everything is going to be section 15.247-I, limits the amount of exposure. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, it comes up and it says that the maximum exposure that you can have uh, can, uh, is the time that can be energized. Um, and if you look at the military spec, it's 7.2 watts safe exposure. But the safe distance from any UHF antenna, they're saying is nine inches. Now, any given standard, uh, the, it requires it. So that's what the safety standard is for uh, for, for the U.S. And in fact, for uh, the rest of the world is very, very much the same, uh, is nine inches. That does not mean that if you stand within nine inches of an antenna, you're, there's going to be any damage. Uh, however, the, this is what the specifications uh, state, the regulations. Okay, mandates. Uh, the DOD is the most common one in the United States today, widely used one. Uh, Department of Defense requires their providers. If you want to work with DOD, bottom line is they're going to specify you have to use UHF. You have to use UHF, and they have a variety of specifications. It has to be read. You have to use this data syntax uh, uh, 
method of how you store data, where you store data, the format of the data. Uh, and um, once again, if you uh, want to, if you want to do business with the DOD, you have to follow this mandate. If you don't follow the mandate, you can't do business with the DOD. Uh, that's the, okay. And if you're looking at DOD, Department of Defense, here's where you can find some of the websites which go through all the various different mandates. Okay, so that's pretty much what we've uh, talked about as far as standards and all that. Um, from if any of you have any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, come up and uh, we'll talk about questions. If not, we'll proceed to protocols. Okay. So next we're going to go into protocols. So keeping everything in perspective, standards are, are created by standard setting organizations. Regulations are set by regulating agencies. Now within those standards, those they set up those standards and within those standards are specified given protocols. All right, so protocols once again are control the air interface between a tag and a reader. How, how do they communicate to each other? How do they interact with each other? So for example, if in the United States, if you're going to mail a letter or you want to send a letter, first of all, you have to write the letter. When you write the letter, you have to use a 26 character alpha, alphabet. You have to put those 26 letters together into a given form to make words. You have to put those words together in a, in a given structure to form a sentence. You have to put the sentences together in a given form to form a paragraph. You put those paragraphs together to form a letter. You then fo fold up that letter. You put it in an envelope. And on that envelope, you put the who it's going to in the center. Uh, who it's coming from comes in the top left corner. You have to put a postage stamp in the top right corner. Those are all protocols. Every bit of that is all protocols. You can do whatever you want to, but if you don't follow that protocol, it's not going to work. If you decide to put the stamp on the back of the, of the envelope, uh, then it's not going to work. Uh, the letter is going to get rejected. So that's a protocol or a series of protocols. And that's what we're talking about here. And, and aside, the letter itself is the data. All the envelope data, who it's going to, who it's coming from, the stamp, that's all called meta, M-E-T-A, metadata. So when you hear the term metadata versus actual data, that's what you're talking about, is the envelope data versus the content data. All right. But anyway, so that's a protocol. So now when we set up and we're looking at UHF or HF or LF, how does the how does the reader communicate, structure data, send the data, uh, decompose the data, restructure it? How does that all happen? That's a protocol. And each frequency has its own protocol. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Okay. So protocol is the wireless air interface scheme, basically a language that allows tags and readers to communicate with each other. They're defined by manufacturers of the tag or by various standard setting organizations. Now, right now, the all of these standards uh, are set. Right now, everything is standardized, meaning it's open. Uh, there's one exception to that, which we'll talk about later. But in, in this case, Every manufacturer who manufactures, be it be it Alien, be it uh, Intermec, be it uh, uh, I, I want to say Symbol, but it's Zebra. <laughs> so we have Symbol, at Motorola, uh, you have Zebra. Uh, all of these have to, no matter what they make in a tag, what, what they make in a reader, all have to follow the same protocols. Okay. Otherwise, uh, they can't do business. 
uh, they can't interface with each other, which which is good for us because that means when we go into an environment, we can buy tags from any reader, from any vendor who says, yes, I meet the ISO 18006C standard if we're talking about UHF or any uh, reader manufacturer that says, yes, I make readers and we follow the ISO 18006C standard if it's UHF, the ISO 18000 three standard, the 14443, if we're talking about uh, NFC near field communications, or we're talking about credit cards. So anyway, that's why it's important to understand the standards and what protocols relate to those standards. So, okay. So anyway, there are a lot of different protocols, inter interface protocols, which we just talked about, medium access, we have things called multiplexing, collision, resolution, we're going to talk about here briefly, uh, but we'll go into much more detail. It's important for you to understand these uh, in your understanding of RFID. Data def definition, what data is put in the tag, what's the format or structure of data in the tag, all that's controlled by the standards. Uh, and obviously the, the readers in the tag must use the same protocol to communicate. So if you're, if you're going to be working with UHF, you have to have a UHF reader. You have to have a UHF tag. You can't have a UHF reader talk to an HF tag because each of those have different protocols that could not communicate to each other. And everything we have today is standardized. Uh, and fortunately, for once again, for us. Okay. Now we're going to spend most of our time uh, talking about UHF ultra high frequency, uh, since this is the focus of most of the uh, supply chain in the world. We're also going to talk about HF um, here. But so we have what's called an EPC. So we have the electronic product code, EC EPC. And this is an organization that is set up that was originally defined. Uh, and created back uh, as part of a consortium of uh, three universities, uh, Cambridge, uh, MIT, and the University of Australia. They created the basic standard for what is used for supply chain. Um, and that was then, once they got that going and defined, then it was taken over by an organization that was created called EPC, Electronic Product Code organization which is part of the gs1 which is your global standards organization but anyway so epc is the standard setting organization for uhf and so, so they updated we have class what's called class one gen two we have class one gen two version two uh well a variety of those but the key thing here is is the uhf it was set up the standards were set up by epc class one uh, in which case defines UHF passive backscatter interrogator talks first, air interface and data structure standards. What does all of that mean? If you recall, the reader sends out a signal that's in UHF. The signal is captured by the antenna on the tag. That signal activates, provides power to the tag, to the chip, to turn the chip on. And that same wave is reflected back to the reader and that provides the two-way communication link between the reader and the tag. And therefore it's defined as the interrogator talks first, meaning the tag is benign until it is hit by an RF wave from a UHF reader. And then it can send the data back and forth. Operating frequencies, once again, what's UHF? 860 to 960. How much data? You have up to 396 of the, within the memory itself, we're gonna talk about that structure, but within memory itself, you can have up to 256 bits of data. Uh, correction, some other features here. Anti-collision, we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, working different, all the different countries. This is important. You recall UHF has 860 to 960 megahertz range. So therefore, the standard says if I build a tag that it has to work at anywhere between 860 megahertz to 960 megahertz which means it has to work anywhere in the world. If I build a reader, that reader has to be able to be configured so that it will operate anywhere in the world. Um, and then we have, and it was ratified, and this is 18,006C. All right. 
So we talked up here, we talked about the operating frequency, the amount of memory that's available in the tag. So within the memory of the tag, we have what's called non-volatile memory, meaning it, it once you write it there, it stays there until it's overwritten or erased. And you have four memory banks. Three are mandatory, one is optional. So bank zero, zero, you have in your reserve memory, you have a kill password and an access password. This is some of the security that was added as part of the class one gen two standard EPC. Uh, ISO 18,006 C, all right. You have your memory bank where you actually control your data or, or write your data, your electronic product code. You have CRC, which is a cyclical redundancy check, and you have a protocol control bit that tells what's the format, what's the structure of the data that's in here. So your data is actually, your electronic product code is written in bank 01, all right? Access kill passwords, which is your security feature, is written in bank 00. You have what's called a tag ID. Every tag has a tag ID, and that's written in memory bank 10 or memory bank, let's get the third memory bank. Those three memory banks are required to be on all chips. Optionally, you can buy a chip that has an additional additional memory on the chip itself in which you can store user data, and this is bank 1.1, all right? Now, what's important here is, is that we're talking, th these numbers are binary. So the first bank, which is bank zero, is access password. The second bank, which is bank zero one, is your product code. Your third bank, which is bank, is your tag ID, uh, memory, and then the fourth bank, if it, if it's on the if it's on the chip, is the uh, where you put user data. All right. So <clears throat> this is just uh, the next layer down if you call bank zero zero is your reserved memory that's where your access passwords are and the data is written in blocks and the amount of data and so you have blocks that are 16 bits long and so you can see what the bits are what the bit location within the block or within the block what data is written in there uh, and so uh, all right so key thing here is your reserve memory Block 100 is your access kill passwords. EPC is your uh, electronic product code, which is where your actual data is written. Uh, your, the tag ID is written in tag three. And then you have your user memory. If you have user memory, it, then it's up to you to define what that structure is, okay? Reserve memory, the kill password. With the advent of 18,006C, uh, you can kill a tag, meaning that uh, you can literally make it unreadable, uh, electronically unreadable, uh, and it cannot be, you can have it not be reserved, reversed once you kill a tag. Uh, you can also put a an access code, a security code, so that uh, if you want to, to, before you can read the tag, you have to provide the security code. Uh, and that's your access password. The key to both of these is that at the beginning, when these tags arrive at your site, the kill password and the 32-bit access password are set to zero, all zeros. So when they arrive at your site, they're all zeros. And if you want to provide it, the kill password, then you have to write a kill password into the kill password area and overlay the zeros with the kill password, then you can kill a tag by issuing a kill command. The same thing with access, the access code. If you want to access, you have to first write an access code into the access memory. And then you can, when you issue the read command, you can specify that it has to and provide the uh, access code to be able to read the tag. All right. The key here, once again, these are zero to begin with when they arrive from the factory and you have to write a password in there before you can kill it you have to write a password into the access memory bank before you can use that access memory bank for to securely read that tag okay managing tag population how does a tag work in this case we're talking about uhf ultra high frequency 
Uh, and so the first step in the process is called the select. So every time a reader issues a command, the first command for UHF that it reads is to select. Now, the so select, when we read a tag, we can put filters in there that says ignore all tags that are written this way. For example, if we have inventory bags, tags, and we have personnel badges, both are encoded. When we read something going through a portal, we can say ignore all personnel badges because we don't want to do it. So we would have encoded something into the personnel ta uh, tag data that would allow it to identify that this is a personnel badge. And therefore, when I do, the first thing my reader does is does a select and it says, okay, I'm only going to select, <clears throat> excuse me, my inventory tags. I'm going to ignore anything other than my inventory tags. So that's the select command. Once you've selected and say, this is what I'm going to read, then you have the inventory command. The inventory command says, okay, what have I actually selected? <clears throat> How much do I have? How many do I have? How do, and then obviously if you're reading a, a palette with 100 tags on it, uh, 100 inventory tags, it would inventory and it would say I have 100 tags. And now it has to isolate those tags to get to get to one tag because a reader can only read one tag at a time. So a reader can only read one tag at a time. Therefore, if I have 100 tags, the reader has to go through what's called an anti-collision algorithm, which we'll talk about here shortly shortly to isolate a tag and come up with a tag. Once it comes up with that tag, that's all part of the inventory command. Then it goes to it says, okay, now I'm going to access the data on that tag. I'm going to read it, I'm going to write it, whatever I'm going to do to it. <clears throat> so the read process is when I reading managing a tag population, first I select, which means I filter out those tags I don't want. Then I have to inventory of those that I do want. I have to identify them and I have to identify one specific tag that I'm going to work with and then I can access that tag. Every, all th that's the process every time when a, a reader reads a tag. So if there are 100 tags in the population, it has to read 100 times. It can't read all the tags all at once. It has to read them one at a time and then goes through a process we, that we'll call pull to sleep, put to sleep, that and then it goes back and gets another tag. Now, the other important thing to this is that because of this, there is no guarantee of the order in which the reader is going to read a tag. In other words, if you put five tags into the field, it isn't going to read the one closest to the reader first, second, third, fourth. There is no order in which you can specify or sequence in which the tags are going to be read. So it may read the last thing that came into the field first, the third one, the fifth one, whatever it is. So you cannot make the assumption that the tags are going to be read in the order in which they enter the field. Okay. So that's how you manage how a reader reads. And this just goes through the process uh, where the interrogator issues a query command uh, and then starts doing the isolation. Is this and that's what the RN16 is. Uh, and then, it, yes, I want it. No, I don't want it. Then, then if you look at the where it comes back with the PC, EPC in the center, that's the where it has done the inventory, comes back, identifies a given tag, and then down at the bottom, it works with the actual tag. So this is just a diagram that shows that process of how it goes through and reads, isolates each tag, and reads it. Okay. Another concept that you have within the EPC uh, 18006C, also called the Class 1 Gen 2 standard, is uh, what's called frequency hopping. I mentioned earlier in the United States, we have 902 to 928 frequency range. That's been broken down into 50 kilohertz channels which means that we have 50 workable channels within the United States. And if you have more than one reader transmitting uh, within that frequency range at the same time, which you are almost always going to have, that you're going to have the chance that a, a given reader is, is going to go out to a, a frequency and say, I want to read on this frequency. 
Now, another reader may already have tied up and used that frequency and be using that frequency, in which case the first reader has to then come back and say, okay, that frequency is busy, so now I need to hop to another frequency, another 500 kilohertz channel. Now, is that channel busy? And, and so when it does that, until it finds a channel that is not busy, in which case it can then use that channel to transmit the data. All right, so that's called channel hopping. And the way it works is that when a reader issues a read command, it, we have what's called a, uh, a channel within each reader. It specifies the channels in which it's going to read. I'm gonna to go to this channel first. If that one's busy, I'm gonna to go to the second channel. And that's called, called your hop channel, hop frequency, hop table. Um, and so each reader, when it goes to that particular channel, it listens to see if that channel is busy. And that's called listen before talk. And if so it listens, if it's busy, then it hops over to another channel. Is this channel listens? Is this busy? If it's busy, it'll hop to a third channel, et cetera. All right. And so that'll go through, uh, and, and that L, uh, listen before talk, LBT, was established as a basis because of particularly the issues within the EU. Now in the United States, we have 50 channels. So do we have 50 readers transmitting at the same time? And are all the channels gonna be uh, occupied? It, it's a pretty low probability that they're all gonna be occupied. In Europe, on the other hand, if you remember back on our frequency range, their channels are only 200 kilohertz wide and they only have 10 usable channels. So the chance of having 10 readers talking at the same time is much greater. And so to avoid readers colliding that we invented or the, the concept of listen before talk was implemented uh, throughout all of the uh, ISO 18006C class one Gen 2 protocol. Okay, so that's channel hopping. Gene, uh, we are already yes, over time. Uh, okay. Uh, so probably okay. we need to wrap and put it across for next session. Uh, at okay. Break. Okay, sounds good. Why don't, why don't we stop there then? Uh, and we'll uh, continue at the uh, next session. So, so just going back through here, we're going through uh, the protocols within uh, UHF class one gen two um, standard. Okay. So yeah, why don't we wrap it up then? Uh, and if any of you have any questions, you, you unmute yourself and we have questions. Um, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll continue this on uh, unmuted on the fourth. I have already unmuted everyone. Uh, the platform is now open for uh, discussion for a couple of minutes. Please ask any questions uh, if you have. Uh, right. Otherwise, uh, uh, once again, uh, now next session is on Wednesday, April 4th at 10 a.m. EST. We will be putting more quizzes next week, uh, and we are all looking forward to see you on April 10th, uh, room S320, FNG, Orange County Convention Center. Before that, all for the RFID4U team is available. Any questions, you can always send at info at RFID4U.com. It will reach all the people who will be on site, and we are looking forward to see you next week at 10 a.m. EST. With this, I'll close this session and see you next week. Thank you. Okay.